<laughs> Series four, we've got uh, Catherine Tate is back as Donna. <laughs> it's great to be back. Yeah, it's as if I never left, actually. She's a brilliant character. Catherine's a great actress. Oh, I know all that bit. Catherine's first day on set just felt like she'd never been away. With the script for Partners in Crime complete, the cast and crew are gathered at their Cardiff studios for the first read-through of the series. The read-through is vital for a production team. It's the only time we get to hear the whole thing uh, before we sit in the edit, because then everything is filmed out of sequence. So it's, uh, it becomes a radio play. You can sit in your office, you can break scripts down, you can read them in bed, you can imagine how they're going to be and how they're going to sound, but until you hear the actors you've cast, reading those lines. It's the first time, really, that the whole thing comes to life. Marvellous, yes, hooray. I'll be reading the stage directions. This is always exciting. <laughs> a lot of them in it. I might have to read a few more than I normally would, because you skip it, but Confidential asked me to read out certain bits in detail. Did you know what they're like? So there we go. <laughs> I am just a slave to them. And it's brilliant to see, you, see everyone back and to welcome back Donna officially into... <laughs> You're right, at last. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone else. Have a good time. Okay, so right, scene one omitted. Oh, good start. There we go. <laughs> it was a great scene, Sam. <laughs> Exterior nobles house. False cheeky music. Donna steps out, head held high on a mission. <laughs> Donna walking along, left to right. The doctor walking along, right to left. Donna stops in the street and looks up Tower Block, which is the HQ of Adipose Industries. The first mm, half of the episode is basically about the fact that the two of them kind of keep missing each other. Does he need a coat? Yeah. Thanks, then. Ooh. What's that? And that Donna's been looking for the doctor. Bringing uh, as someone who's met the Doctor before back is actually a chance for some great comedy, actually. It's like the, the opening 20 minutes of Partners in Crime, where they're simply missing each other. It's just irresistible. I think you really get the sense of Donna's desperation to find him, which is really endearing, I think. Um, I, I, and I love that part of the script. <laughs> It's pretty surprising when the Doctor uh, sees Donna for the first time. It's fairly uh, unlikely. Uh, in his mind, of course, until he realises that she's been chasing him, it's such a random event. In the middle of, of him uh, pursuing an alien invasion, he stumbles across Donna Noble from two Christmases ago. It's a great way to reintroduce the characters to each other um, in a moment of great peril you have this sort of dumb show uh, and you saw that on the page that you know you, 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 that them miming this conversation to each other the doctor looks straight ahead and donna looks straight ahead and she sees him and he sees her Big long moment with his boggling open mouth, then all shot through the glass in silence, big gestures. The doctor's like, Donna. She's like, Doctor, what? And she says, Oh my God, but how? It's me. And he said, Well, I can see that. She's like, Oh, this is brilliant. There was just this paragraph that Catherine had to somehow translate through the gift of mime. She does a little mime hacking. Yeah, trouble, internet, pills, places weird, hit there, back, crept along, head, this, you, and on they. <laughs> <laughs> 
said to James Strong, the director the day before, I said, have you got any thoughts about that, you know, at all? <laughs> and he said, uh, no. He said, and I'll ask Russell. And then the, the, the message came back was, oh, see, see what Catherine comes up with. <laughs> so I kind of did it a bit on the hoof, actually. Well, as we were filming it, really, and just mucked about a bit with it and uh, will be taking a, a, a career in mime a lot further in performance art. <laughs> But it's a, it's a lovely first scene uh, and beautifully placed in the episode, just as the stakes are, are, are getting higher. These two characters that you've been watching just miss each other for, uh, you know, the first 20 minutes um, suddenly collide into each other at the most inopportune moment. We're interrupting you. And the Dr. Sonics the winch and zoom, he disappears up. Donna runs up the stairway. Doctor arrives back on the roof, runs across to the access door. On the stairwell, the Donna's running up, the Doctor's running down, they meet on a landing. Oh, my God! I don't believe it! You've even got the same suit! Don't you ever change! Thanks, Donna, not right now. <laughs> it was funny, Catherine's first day on set just felt like she'd never been away. It was, uh, it was like, uh, you know, catching up with an old mate. <laughs> Because it's the second time I've worked with him, he, um, I don't have to curtsy every, every morning, which was the ritual when I was in the Christmas special, which was a little bit, you know, much, but fair enough, really. So now I don't have to, so that's great. <laughs> you look older. Thanks. <laughs> and Donna felt like she'd never been away as well. Catherine just kind of uh, nails it uh, from the instant she walks on set. <laughs> Off we go then. So it all felt it felt very natural, funnily enough. It didn't feel like uh, it was the start of anything new. It felt like it was the continuation of something that we'd that we'd had going on before. Just like old times. And they run up the stairs together. Because I thought, how do you find the doctor? And then I just thought, look for trouble, and then he'll turn up. So I looked everywhere. You name it: UFO sightings, crop circles, sea monsters, those weird things in Cardiff. I investigated them all. She is much more um, straight talking with him. Because the thing is, doctor. I believe it all now. All those amazing things out there, I believe them all. Well, except for that replica of the Titanic flying over Buckingham Palace on Christmas time. I mean, that's got to be a hoax, hasn't it? There's far less um, overt admiration for him. Come on, here you go. What? Into that thing? Yes, into that thing. But if we go down in that, they'll just call us back up again. She's forthright. She's uh, caustic. This is your fault! I should have stayed at home! She's very funny, very witty, uh, very sharp. Some people just can't take it. No. And some people can. Doesn't take any nonsense from anybody, no matter what species they may be. What about poor Stacy? She knows who she is. She's, she's, in that sense, she's more of a grown-up than Rose or Martha were. She's a great sort of level pegging for the doctor to bring, to bring him down and to just nail him sometimes and, and to call on him on his judgments. Doctor, tell me, what do you need? I need a second capsule to boost the override, but I've only got one. I can't save them. If she working as Donna calmly reaches into her pocket, and she holds up her gold capsule and pendant. The doctor looks at her, she looks at him, a moment suspended, just magic. The great thing she does for the Doctor is, is give him a hard time, actually, about his morals, about the way he thinks about the universe, about the way he thinks about humanity. What are you going to do, then? Blow him up? They're just children. They can't know where they came from. Oh, well, that makes a change from last time. She's the Doctor's equal in a, in a way that Rose and Martha weren't. Still on your own? Yeah, well, no, I had, this, I had this friend, Martha. She was called Martha Jones. She was brilliant, yeah. She fancied me. Mad Martha, that one. Blind Martha. Charity Martha. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because the character isn't, hasn't romanticised the Doctor. She just sees him as this 
peer, really, this kind of contemporary and, 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 and equal um, that, that does strip away the, well, the, the kind of rose-coloured glasses. And she makes it perfectly clear to the Doctor that there's no danger of her falling in love with him. You just want to mate! <laughs> I just want a mate. You're not mating with me, sunshine. <laughs> I want a mate. Just as well. I know mean, that nonsense. You're a skinny streak of nothing. Me, you know nothing. There we are then, OK. For all her kind of straight talking and bossiness and you don't impress me and listen, really, you're not, I don't want a mate, you know what I mean? There was that whole kind of thing there. She's actually the one, well, she, she, she's actually m much more affected by things and she, she I think she, gives a, a very human response to the things that go on around her. She's had to fight a lot through her life, and I think she's, she's a very intelligent woman because of that. Donna's had her formative years. She's after, she's after making sure that her, 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 uh, the rest of her life lives up to the potential that perhaps the first part of her life didn't. <sighs> oh, was right. It's always like this with you, isn't it? Oh, yes. And off we go. Oi! Come on! And bang, the door opens. They go out to the roof. The roof's empty. The cradle's gone. The lowering mechanism clearly at work. And cut to the wide shot of the building. There's the Doctor and Donna heading down. I mean, the cradle sequence really is classic action movie formula. Miss Foster's smiling. Oh, I don't think so. Aims her sonic pen, the rooftop winch explodes, the Doctor and Donna and the game plummet down... God help us. Ta plummet down, tower block falls racing past them. You get these sequences now and again, usually the big action sequences, that must, if you're a director, they must make your brain bleed a little bit, just trying to make sure you can paste them all together. And they're making their escape in a window cleaner's cradle down the side of the building. Um, but that was possibly the single biggest logistical challenge of my entire career. So it was a combination of the real location, the real location doubling up somewhere else. So we had two locations which were, we were saying was the one location, plus the green screen element, plus the actual set that we built as well for, for certain ones. So you kind of like four or five different elements of, the, of one scene with four different people doing it. So you've got Catherine and David, you've got two stunt performers in four or five different locations. and green screen shots and stunt shots and explosions and windows and stuff. So that was absolutely um, imperative that we planned and planned. Do you know, I could sit here and take into account the logistical nightmare that it took the director and the production manager and the producer and the stunt coordinator. I don't care. They just go out there and make it brilliant. <laughs> Can I say that? Can we give Bob a schedule? Day one, Ruth, Tuesday the 9th of October. Oh, Night shooting. So that's 1800 to 5 in the morning. Um, vertical cradle, this is the doctor uh, within the cradle in that position. This is the bit where, the, where you, you're going down and it stops. Yeah. It stops. Which way do we go? Um, if you go that way, David goes that way. What we've just done. To yeah, so basically, so, you, 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 so we'd be down there. Still there, there and then down, down, and then, right. and then, bang, whoa, and then get back up, and, and then do the whole. Right. Here we go. And action. Oh. Stop. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We can get him through the window. Smash it then. We'll be on another shot. Might as well be made of chocolate. <laughs>
Oh, I'm chocolate toolboxes. <laughs> I mean, there are moments where it's very difficult to visualise quite what it is they're needing to, to... But you have to trust that James knows what he needs to glue the, the sequence together. Have a smash. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And then, and then... Stop slapping. The metal cable starts to burn like an oxyacetylene torch. The cable's fraying, both in the cradle, look up. Got in the cable! When the cradle was lowered actually down the side of the building, we weren't allowed to be in it. I was desperate to go down the side of the building. I quite like a bit of a height, um, and I, th I thought it would be quite fun, but... Um, but I suppose I'm not the person who has to answer to the insurers when an actor falls to their death down the side of a building, so I, I have to just surrender to, um, to, uh, to those whose job would be on the line when it comes to things like that. With the actual descend in the cradle, Dave and Catherine did the on up here stuff on the roof. David would probably do it anyway, but for health and safety and insurance, he's not allowed to. So we get two stunt performers. You do the odd look down, that's great. And Gordon, that David Stubble has also had a little uh, course on how to operate the cradle itself. So, yeah, the, the stunt people on the side of the building, which will tie in us on the roof of the building. There's a lot of green screen which will tie in. It wasn't physically possible for us to drop the cradle off the side of a real building. So, when we broke it down into the shots you actually needed to tell a story, we felt we could achieve them with more control and then and actually make them more exciting by doing them as effect shots. This is the second time we've been on the cradle, but now we're on green screen. So we're inside and we're in the studio. Now we're on it and it is sort of, yeah, it's doing a bit of backwards and forwards and David's making it go even more. <laughs> I'm not, I'm standing here. <laughs> the whole element of, of David having to catch the sonic pen was, uh, was probably one of the trickiest things because he was on a green screen, he had to lean out and catch what is a very small prop in, in his hand. Okay, Here we go. Win. That's it. I hope we got that, because that's <laughs> never going to happen again. Amazing as that was, in uh, many ways, we'll just uh, have one more go. Just to... The catching was just slightly out of frame. You're kidding me. <laughs> just slightly. But it won't be I now. caught that puppy. The actual stunt of this cable snapping and uh, Catherine falling out of it was shot entirely with stunt doubles. The key thing with most stunts, actually, is to try and make them believe that it's really the character doing them. OK, in three, two, one, action. OK, good, well done. I think the first take we did, the stunt, Jo, who's a brilliant stunt and performer, she kind of dived out of the, of, of the bucket, which looked amazingly dramatic, but it perhaps doesn't really reflect what the reality would be if it was you and I in the bucket. So it's in the second one, we actually slowed it down and so she kind of more sort of fell out and, and it looked more awkward, and, but it looked more real. Guys, in three, two, one, action. The doctor reaches out for but missing Donna, tumbling over the edge, screaming, and the doctor slams into what was the wall and now is the floor of the cradle, whipping his head over to see... Donna! And she's hanging on to a cable. If you're an aspiring writer, take something like that window cleaner's cradle sequence from beginning to end and try and write it out on paper, describing exactly what happens clearly with no misunderstanding. What's left, what's right, when the winch controls break or when the actual stop button's working, what blows up which side where, at which point Miss Foster crosses over. It's a hugely, hugely technical exercise that the, the doctor who has taught all of us um, um, how to do and how to write, but it's a real... I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to do a writer's class and sit people down and say, actually describe that sequence to me so that it cannot be done in any different way. It's really tricky. It has been pulled off beautifully. And on a hillside, we see Donna trudging up a lonely hillside, and there's her dad, Jeff, sitting on a little camping chair with a telescope. Nice amateur astronomer, all nice and quiet. In bringing Donna back, we bring back her family as well. We found ourselves in a very sad situation where 
the uh, lovely actor Howard Atfield, who played uh, Donna's father, uh, was very ill, and we did bring him back for some filming. And um, but um, his illness, the extent of his illness, became obvious to us and to him actually, and sadly died soon afterwards. So, um, which is very sad, and a uh, lovely man and lovely actor as well. Aye, aye. Here comes trouble. Mission to board ship, sir. What's she nagging you? Big time. Bought your thermos. And a Mars bar. Seen anything? Oh, I've got Venus with an apparent magnitude of minus 3.5. At least that's what it says in my book. Come and see. We didn't want to recast the father. I thought that would uh, just an insult in a way to the memory and not fair, you know? And, and I don't think any, any of us would have felt comfortable with a new man playing Donna's father. How far away is that? <sighs> About 26 million miles. Uh, later episodes, he's remembered, there's, there's mentions of the father, so he's remembered nicely and with dignity. But we'll get there, Monday. hundred years' time, we'll be striding amongst the stars, just you wait. So we then decided we were going to uh, write in Donna's granddad. We've got a new family dynamic moving on, and it's a great family. The great thing about New Doctor Who has been the way that, that I think the, 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 the companions to the Doctor have had home lives and, and a world of their own, really, that we can keep going back to and, and, and keep reminding the audience of. Um, and I think this is, an, you know, another turn of the wheel. <laughs> Another companion means a whole new family affair. Confidential takes a peek at Donna's home life and invites you to meet the nobles. Yes, sir. I think they've radioed This is the most exciting thing that's happened to me this morning. Stunning. The nice thing about Donna's family is that it sort of it demonstrates that she's, you know, she's somebody who's perhaps a little bit stuck in her life and. Um, her mother, you know, who means terribly well, is slightly overbearing and, you know, quite aspirational and wants wants to better herself, thinks Donna should better herself. I think that's something that quite a lot of people can identify with, with their families. Look at you. I mean, you're never going to find a flat, not while you're on the toe. It's no good sitting there, dressed up, looking like a job. And you've got to do something. The kind of dynamic that's happened is she's had to move back from... She's had to move back home, and there's a, it's a very fractious mother-daughter relationship. Uh, like any mother, I have hopes and ambitions for her, and she seems to be going from job to job to job. It's not the, like the 1980s. No one's unemployed these days except you. You've got my favourite thing, which is mothers and daughters sniping at each other. All you mothers and daughters snipe at each other all the time. As far as Sylvia's concerned, she just has a daughter that's had unsuccessful relationship uh, and isn't getting work and needs help and support and has moved back home. And so, of course, instead of showing that just in a loving, supportive way, I get a bit irritated with her. How long did that job with health and safety last? Two days. And then you walk out. I've not seen them. She's the kind of woman that will find fault. And it's no good sitting there dreaming. No one's going to come along with a magic wand and make your life all better. You can't turn around saying, well, actually, I have got this grand plan. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek out this great alien that I met once and he's going to take me around the universe, you know. Where's Grandad? Where do you think he is? Up the hill. He's always up the hill. Keep going, Ed. Aye, oh, aye. Yeah. Here comes trouble. Was she nagging you? <laughs> Big time. Yeah. <laughs> Pull your thermos. Oh, top. And um, Bernard Cribbins had appeared in our Christmas special. London at Christmas? Not safe, is it? I think we looked at that and thought, you know, why not capitalise on it and bring him back? You seen anything? Yeah, I've got Venus. There, yeah, with an apparent magnitude of minus 3.5, at least. That's what it says in my little book. Yeah, come and see. Come on. Here you go. He fills the role that Donna's dad would have filled. You know, that kind of confidant for her. The person who knows the truth about what she's doing but doesn't let on. The person who encourages her, really, in many ways, to look to the stars, um, to look out there uh, 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 how wonderful life can be. 2050, take two A and B, come on board. Action. 
I suppose you've seen a little blue box. Is that slang for something? No. <laughs> I mean it. If you lead, as I think she felt she did, lead a very banal, mundane, same old, same old kind of life, why wouldn't you go with this dazzling doctor? If you ever see a little blue box flying up there in the sky, just shout for me, right? Oh, you just shout. Obviously, we know Catherine Tate as a, as a great comic actor, so you've got all that. Um, uh, coming out of the script because people know that they're writing for her and also the way she'll turn a line will, will keep surprising you. Uh, and then she'll surprise you again by, by, by fulfilling all the emotional moments uh, as powerfully as she does as well. She seems to have a valve that taps right into her soul and into the soul of Donna. It's just... The things I've seen... Sometimes I think I'm going mad. I mean, even tonight, I was in a... Not yourself, I'll give you that. You just, you seem to be drifting, sweetheart. I'm not drifting. I'm waiting. What for? The right man. <laughs> it's the same old story, a man! <laughs> I don't mean like that. But, but he's real. I've seen him. I've met him just once. And then... I let him fly away. Well, there you are. Go and find him. I've tried. He's nowhere. Hey, not like you to give up. Where's she gone? <laughs> Where's that girl, eh? You're right. Because he's still out there. Somewhere. And I'll find him. Even if I have to wait a hundred years. Adipose Industries, the 21st century way to lose weight. And here it is. One capsule once a day for three weeks, and the fat, as they say... The fat just walks away. The adipose are fat, living fat. Funny as I get middle-aged and spread that I write stories like this. But it's, it's like, because I, I think, I wanted a monster that was, that was, we've done big, burly, scary, fanged monsters. We've done werewolves, we've done a Lazarus monster and stuff like that. And I'm sure we will again. But I sort of thought, you look at what CGI is doing these days and the sort of stuff, and we've never done, like, big crowd replication monsters, like bugs or things like that. And I, but I just wanted something a bit more bizarre and surreal and puppety and, you know, there's a cuteness to them, and I think, I think they're sort of funny, but I don't think they're funny at all. I think they're absolutely macabre. <laughs> It's a nice idea, isn't it, that you take a pill to, to uh, transform your life's woes, that you could have as much chocolate cake as you could ever wish for and not have to worry about the consequences because you could just take a pill and be rid of it. Um, what's nice about the, the whole adipose thing is that it's not actually that bad if it worked. It's a kind of win-win situation for everyone, really. I mean, yeah, Matron Cophelia shouldn't be doing it. And there is the dangerous side effect that if it all goes wrong, it, it, it destroys you utterly. But when you see the characters for whom it's working, they're, they're rather pleased about it. I feel fantastic. It's a new Lisa life. <laughs> One of the um, characters entire body gets absorbed by them. So what they do is quite scary. Back in Stacey's bathroom, she's boggling, looking down as her skin stretches out. Nothing actually breaking through, no broken skin or blood. Instead, the stretching skin is whitening and smoothly dividing off, and a lump plops free with Stacey standing by the sink. It just plops down into the bowl, 
and the stomach twangs back to normal, and the lump is an adipose, standing in the sink bowl like a bag of sugar, with little arms and legs, little black dots, little mewling mouth. You're not good, you? <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought him with you, should see it. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a soft toy, he's waving little stumpy arms and says he stays, he's just boggling. Mm. What are you? For the sequences where the adipose are moving under people's clothes, we, we talked long and hard about how we were going to achieve them. Um, and, and basically any effects came up with this sort of bladder system. Um, so, the, so the actors wore a sort of corset underneath their clothes, into which were were stitched bladders with airlines coming away from them and so an effects technician would basically push buttons that blew air in, into and inflated these various bladders at various points on people's body. Building the mechanics behind that bulging fat was a challenge the effects team relished getting their teeth into. Walks into the room Feels like a big balloon I said, hey girls, you are beautiful can a pizza, please? Daco, come on, my knees screaming. Big girl, you are beautiful. You take your skinny girl. I feel like I'm gonna die. Cause a real woman needs a real man. Here's why. You take your girl and multiply her by four. Now a whole lot of women needs a whole lot more. Get yourself to the butterfly lounge. Find yourself a big lady. The door is locked and started. Stacey's struggling with the bumps. Help me! Oh my god, help me! Donna's thumping at the door. Stacey! Stacey! <laughs> In a second, she's gone. Her whole body divides into separate pieces. 20 separate adipose plop tumbling to the floor in amongst her falling, empty clothes. Then we see on the floor a number of adipose waddling about, heading for the walls. Donna hears something, listens, tiny giggling, scurrying noise. She shoves at the door hard. And let go. The bolt flies open, the door opens, she stands there, she sees the clothes on the floor, and there on the windowsill is one little ladder post, gives Donna a little wave, like bye bye, and it hops out of the window, we gone. They were completely CGI creations, so we had nothing on the set to shoot. Although, <laughs> although the art department did, did make a little woolly one, so we did have a few woolly pretend ones. And these? Oh, my children. <laughs> She's making little adiposium babies out of um, human fat. And, um, and they're lovely. It's quite sweet, isn't it? Well, he's got his back. He has? Quite a large one. And that's, a, that's supposed to be a fang. Miss Foster was, uh, I mean, it's not without reason that Donna calls her super nanny. That's literally where the costume came from and the glasses and, and the pose and everything, because everyone latched onto that and said, she's super nanny, come space villain. And, and just perfect casting. I mean, you, you, you offer to Sarah Lancashire and you just hope she'll say yes. And we got her and she came down, which I think is wonderful for a first episode. According to my older boys, um, it's the coolest thing ever and probably the coolest thing that I've ever done. At last. I think what Sarah does brilliantly is, is she doesn't look a bit like Super Nanny, but she does what the perfect nanny does, which is to be absolutely calm and poised and unflappable. Sit there. I'm phoning my editor. I said sit. You know, that supreme chilling calm that they project that really unnerves you, actually. And she does that. She takes that nanny and just ups it into villain level. What sort of a country do you think this is? Oh, it's a beautifully fat country. And believe me, I've travelled a long way to find obesity on this scale. She's been employed um, by um, the Adiposian family to, um, to breed a new generation of little Adiposians. Outside Adipose Industries, Miss Foster strides out, stands there triumphant like Eva Perron. Children! Oh, my children, behold! I am taking you home. And we reveal the streets of our full of hundreds of adipose all going, yay! Far across the galaxy, 
Murphy, your new mummies and daddies are waiting, and you will fly. Gestures up with wham, strong, wide, bluish beam flight <laughs> shaft down from the spaceship. Up you go, babies. Up you go. See a bunch of adipose lifting up in the beam of light, and then hundreds of adipose all lifting up from the streets. That's it. Fly away home. And on the rooftop, the Doctor and Donna burst out and stop and awestruck seeing the sky full of adipose, the air glowing with beam light as hundreds of the little dot-sized creatures rise up. What are you going to do, then? Blow up? Well, it's children. They can't know where they came from. Over here, we have uh, the Doctor and Donna looking out at uh, all the adipose as they lift up into the air with these huge sort of big blue uh, beams. I'm waving at fans. But she has a dire plan. It's all work. There she is! Cut there. OK, walk away, clean plate, please. And if we can walk away, still running. Thank you, guys. We're going to have a clean plate here. Oh, I see what you mean. And then, once we've got... A nice uh, foreground with the Doctor and Donna. We can then bring in our um, effects. So for our effects, we're going to have hundreds, potentially hundreds, of uh, little adipose that are, are flying up. Um, so each one is going to, with a bit of luck, have a, a little bit of different animation. We've actually got software that we're hoping to utilise for this. And for most of our adipose shots, when they're in, when there's many of them, which will sort of artificially, um, like an artificial in intelligence, it will try and do separate moves for them so we don't have an animator there trying to animate moves for hundreds upon hundreds of adipose. So hopefully we're going to have our adipose all flying up in, you know, maybe about six different beams of light and they're sort of bluish light coming towards us and then at a certain point, we'll have several shots like that. We'll have a, a close-up and a, a medium-wide shot. And then at a certain point, we're going to have um, Nanny coming up. And uh, we'll see her with some adipose in the foreground, with some adipose in the background, uh, floating into shot on her levitation beam. Four, five, four, six, one, eight, nine, eight. And action. Where's your gophelia? Listen to me! Oh, I don't think so, Doctor. And whatever, whatever I say next. Really? Q rolling. Start again. Do you want to remind you? You all right? No, I'm fine. Here we go. <clears throat> and action. Major Gophelia, listen to me! Oh, I don't think so, Doctor. And if I never see you again, it'll be too soon. Oh, why does no one ever listen? I'm trying to help you. Get across to the roof. Can you shift the levitation beam? What? So you can arrest me? Listen, I saw the adiposing instructions. They know it's a crime breeding on Earth. So what's the one thing that they want to get rid of? Their accomplice! I'm far more than that. I'm nanny to all these children. Exactly. Mum and Dad have got the kids now. They don't need the nanny anymore. Lights. Drop. It's a nice, it's a, it's a, it's a nice different type of story because... Although the matron is a bit of a, a, a bit of a baddie, it's not that straightforward. And actually, the, the, there's quite a symbiotic relationship between the humans and the adiposians. If only it were working out a bit smoother than, than it is. I suppose you can wonder whether um, a matron Gophelia is doing her job or not. The real villains are the adipose family off stage, who are seeding planet Earth with this. She's absolutely a villain, though. I mean, lovely Stacy. Think of Stacy. She, she sits at home, she's going out on a date, she's happy, she's lost weight, she's a lovely woman in her own house, and she dies on her own bathroom floor, splitting into fat. It's a terrible death. Miss Foster deserves everything that's coming to her. I think she's a goodie, by the way. I don't think she's a baddie. Um, if she is a baddie, maybe it's just that we're seeing things from a slightly different perspective, but I've persuaded myself that actually she's quite a nice lady. Back to it. So then, TARDIS. Come on! So, whole wide universe. Where do you want to go? Oh, I know exactly the place. Which is? Two and a half miles that way.
constellation dies Do what you want Cause it's your own sky Donna! Donna! Stops ringing. Yes, Donna! It's, it's the flying blue box! It's cold and rain and freezing What? It's never all that easy to decide This is a land of a thousand words But it seems so few Baby, can you put that all down? To say. Except I'll be looking after my own words <laughs> It's just the joy joy of someone being able to travel off in time and space to see that by a grandfather, one of my favourite things we've ever done. He doesn't resent that, he doesn't envy her, he stands there and cheers and waves her off and says, go get it girl and grab it and, and, and do what I never did. And then suddenly, at the end of this episode, Donna Noble, the happiest moment of her life, runs up to a blonde woman in the crowd who turns around and is Rose Tyler. Ethan, um... This woman comes along, a tall blonde woman called Sylvia. Tell her that been there. It all makes sense, all right? That been there. going on there? How could she be standing on that street? Why does she fade away? Like I'm going to tell you now. You're just going to keep watching. Join Doctor Who Confidential next time as we take a volcanic voyage and witness a blast from the past. We are here in Rome. We're at the Tuna Cheetah Studios. We are here because the studio is doubling as Pompeii. We've got centurions and we've got slaves and we've got rich people and we've got poor people and we've got market traders, smoke, chickens, <laughs> chaos. Plus, we take an exclusive tour with David Tennant and go up Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. Well, it is rather alarmingly smoky. It is, it is. Do we is. have to worry about that? Well, <laughs> yes and not, because I told you, any time there could be a new eruption. You're very chilled out here. You're very cool. Well, uh, that's life. <laughs>